Well, good afternoon, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and share something that I feel passionate about, and that's gem cutting more as an art form than anything else. Uh, but before I get started, I want to thank a couple of people. First is uh, Will Smith, who was kind enough to let me fly into Nashville and put me up and take me over the mountains and stopped by at the William Holland School of Lapidary Arts, which I'd never been to before. And if you haven't been there, it's well worth the drive up there just to see what they have going on. And everybody up there that I met is just more than willing. They want to teach you everything that they, everything that they can. And they want you to learn, they want you to ask questions, and they're there to help you. So that, that was really well worth the trip. And uh, then he put me up in this beautiful little cabin uh, alongside a little creek bed and everything. And I'm like Marsh. I, I really enjoy the sounds of nature and everything. Uh, sounds were coming at the break of day. Uh, you just barely, barely see some light and the wood thrush was welcoming me in my day and it was awesome because like I said, when you're working so hard to try to get things done, it is uh, a challenge. And many of you, I'm sure in your work day experience understand what I'm talking about. So I didn't record it, but I, I want, I'm gonna try to impersonate the sounds that I heard as I was waking up this morning. You better get your butt out of bed. <laughs> That, that didn't take long. <laughs> uh, oh, no. No, I'm still running on that adrenaline. <laughs> uh, the other person that I would like to thank, who's not here, but it's Joe Rubin with uh, Ultratech Manufacturing. And he's the one who's responsible for seeing to it that we have one of his new fantasy cup machines uh, for demonstration in the back. Uh, this is a very new machine, and you'll see from some of the images of the work that I do, I really get off on all the gizmos and technical information and uh, contraptions and stuff that you can build to do gem cutting more as an art form. And his fantasy cut machine, I, I wish I would have had it available to me when I started cutting. Um, I had to build a lot of my own equipment, but what he's built into this fantasy machine, and I'm not trying to just promote the machine, but um, we've been going back and forth, uh, tweaking a little part here and there, and he's really getting it down, and everybody's really getting excited about what the possibilities are for the fantasy machine. And for those of you who want to go that direction, you're only limited by your own imagination with what that machine is capable of doing. So I'm excited about it and passionate about it, and I want to publicly thank Joe Rubin at Ultratech for uh, supplying that one for me to test drive and uh, for supplying it for the uh, Faceters Frolic here for everybody to take a look at. And please stop by in the demonstration. I'll show you all the bells and whistles that it has and see if I can't get it into your blood as well. What I would like to do is ask you, and I know this is rough, ask you to do a little multitasking after lunch when it's 81 degrees in here and you're all trying to fall asleep. I'm going to start a series of slides that will transition automatically and I'll just talk to you at the same time about some fantasy cutting uh, procedures and what fantasy cutting really is. So to begin with, I think most people, fantasy cutting is not really new. It's been around for literally centuries. Uh, I think it's probably the only last two or three decades that fantasy cutting has been applied to gemstones and typically with the little v-groove cutting. Um, I think my first example of fantasy cutting uh, gemstone, and I'm a career goldsmith, have been for 35 years. I've been cutting gemstones for about 12 years. Uh, my first experience was uh, a stone that was called fantasy cutting and I think somebody just applied that name to kind of romance the stone a little bit. Uh, was in the early 80s. And from that, there's people like uh, Tom Moonsteiner and his son, uh, who have done a, a one, or uh, Bernard Moonsteiner and his son Tom, 
who really brought that to the forefront, did a lot of incisive V-groove cutting into uh, gemstones. And that's typically what you think of when somebody talks about a fantasy cut gem. It's one that's got some incisive V-groove cutting, cutting on the pavilion, cutting on the bottom, cutting on the top, just really at your uh, individual whim, whatever you want to do. Uh, but it's kind of broad. It, it goes and it crosses over. You can do the little bubbles inside gemstones. Um, Michael Diver, to his credit, took an age-old technique, and like I, my philosophy is there's no new technique. What we have available to us has been around for a long time. What you do with that technique, such as V-groove cutting or bubbles or flat lapping, uh, can constitute design. So yes, there's new design coming around, but there's really no new technique available. Um, Michael Diver is probably the one who introduced little dishes and gemstones and using the optical properties that have been borrowed from about three centuries prior and even earlier that was converging and diverging lenses that became our eyeglasses, telescopes, microscopes, and et cetera. He applied it to gemstones as an art form. And since then, a lot of people do some strange little cuts with the little bubbles to play with light. And all you're doing is playing with the light within the gemstone uh, more as an art form. Um, my philosophy is, I li in my, my uh, artist statement, if I was to have one, is it's my goal to take every natural gemstone and with innovative optics and technical techniques, uh, transform it into a, a piece of art, you know, any kind of a work of art. So the sky is open there. Uh, you're only limited by your own imagination. And you can probably already tell from some of the images, I've got a pretty vivid imagination. Uh, when you do that, this kind of cutting though, uh, anybody can go to Crystallite or a lot of the Mountain Mist products. And you can buy a lot of these little diamond burrs that will do a lot of things and anybody can start quiddling away on a gemstone. The problem comes in trying to take it from that whatever cut you've done to the next consecutive polishes and sanding stages. We're not so fortunate to have people like Marsh and people like John Rolfe who have really engineered laps to perfect flat fastening um, and they're doing it with the concave mandrels as well. But there's not all the little points and everything available in carving to be able to do anything that you want to do. So in my quest to learn everything that I can, it becomes a discipline. And let me see a show of hands. How many of you are goldsmiths or do a little bit of silver, silver work? There's, there's a fair amount of you in here. Uh, as a career goldsmith, I took the same discipline. And when I say discipline, I'm talking about things like your polish. You're going to start off by filing and sanding a piece. Then you, you run you know, just silver and gold through a, a Tripoli. You really need to get rid of the Tripoli before you go on to a rouge wheel if you want the highest polish on your finished piece of jewelry. It's a discipline to make sure you clean your fingers off and clean everything off around you uh, in that little environment before you go on to the next stage. So I applied that discipline to lapidary. The only kick is there's actually more stages in lapidary work to take something from your initial grind to all the finishing stages. You may have to work in three or four different stages, whereas jewelry, you can work it up pretty quick if you know what you're doing. So with that in mind, I've gotten real creative and, and I've invented a lot of little wheels. I haven't invented the wheel that's been around for a while. And like I said, there's no new technique. I don't know who the first person to cut a hole in a gemstone was, but I think he was living in a cave. So th there's not really anything new. Uh, I will openly share with you what I've learned for what it's worth, and I don't know at all. Uh, this piece is a piece I call Pass the Torch. And it's symbolic for me and what I really believe. I want to take the knowledge that I've learned, good or bad, and, and I don't always tell you about the mistakes in my shop that don't quite work out. Those stay in a drawer and never see the light of day. And there are plenty of them, um, as I'm sure there are in each of your shop. Uh, I cut a stone one time and, and my wheel grabbed a hold of it 
and before it went around 10 times, it was in about seven or eight pieces. So I traded that to a friend who needed some rough, and he had some nice carving pieces, so we had a nice equitable trade for material. And he asked me, he says, well, what's, what are all these facets around this broken up piece of amethyst? And I told him, I said, well, that was like a fish story. It was the one that got away. <laughs> and he loved it because he wants to go around telling everybody, I fixed an amethyst that Dale and Hargrave screwed up. <laughs> but anyway, I really do believe that if we want to keep this art form alive, and I hear the same thing from so many of you, we need to get the younger generation involved. We need the younger generation involved. You know, how can we keep it going as an art form? One of the ways we do that is by being willing and open to share what we've learned with someone else, being willing to teach. And, you know, the schools like uh, William Holland, uh, where everybody goes up there as a volunteer instructor, and their main goal is they want to teach the craft. Their, their smile comes from seeing their students succeed. And so that's my philosophy. I want to teach what little bit I do know and pass it on in the hopes, if I were to have a goal, is to get you inspired to think outside the box. Um, that's kind of been a theme around my house. The only person that gets in trouble for thinking outside the box is the cat. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit, uh, we'll go through a series of slides and I'll try to do the best I can to explain what you're looking at. I'll start off with a little bit of concave faceting. Uh, we'll go to a compound concave which curves in both directions. Then I'll talk a little bit about the V-groove cutting and I'll be showing you some pictures of uh, some machines and an experiment. And then I'll finish off with just a couple of little shop tips that hopefully you'll get some benefit from. To begin with, that since concave faceting is relatively new, there's always that nerd on the list that says, well, the, just the word concave facet can't be accurate because a facet technically means a flat surface. But, you know, just like computers introduced a whole new terminology in our vocabulary, concave facet really is applicable because the main goal is not to have a freeform surface. It's to have that perfect cylindrical surface as perfectly cylindrical as you can get it and therefore <coughs> concave facet really is a new term that came along with concave faceting. And for the people like uh, Doug Hoffman who put together what I believe is the first production model concave faceting machine, the OMF machine, he opened up that avenue for so many people, literally around the world. Now, there are other people who have invented machines and, and such to do that. It's the machine that's patented, not the curved surface itself. So anybody can come up with a machine that cuts that curved surface and you can patent your version of it. And the book that I'm still putting together and is only on hold because I want to make sure that I include the Fantasy Cut Machine by Ultratech since it's such a wonderful machine. Um, and I want the book not to be dedicated to just one machine. I want to do everything I can to introduce people to all that's available. Um, and, and doing that book, you know, you get into these little battles over somebody thinks, well, that's already been done, it's already been patented. Not the concave facet. I mean, what you do with that facet maybe your own individual design, but not so much the machine. So I have a lot of appreciation for the equipment that goes into it. 